This is just an ad, right? Is it? The Vespa is in the movie, either visually, within the dialogue, or as motivation, for 33 minutes. First entering the movie 15 minutes in, and with a total runtime of 84 until the credits roll, that's almost 40% of the movie focused on the Vespa. And there's plenty more qualifiers to increase that percentage. But just like any hidden agendas that may or may not be there, there's more to the choice of a Vespa than meets the eye. I've covered very few animated vehicles. They don't always mimic real life cars, and often the proportions are skewed. I've introduced this a little bit in my video about the Mitchells versus the machines. Let's dive into it a little bit more. A typical child's character is going to have specific proportions. The head will consistently be bigger around than the body is wide. The eyes will be closer to the center of the face. This is explained actually rather well in the, ironically, worst Pixar movie ever, The Good Dinosaur. In a behind-the-scenes look at the design of Arlo and Spot, the artist talks about dropping the nose and eye line below middle for younger children and awkward, skinny proportions for adolescent characters. So we have proportions that the environment needs to work cohesively with. This means the normal window frame of a car needs to be skewed as well to allow the hidden camera lens to see the proportions of the character. The environment, meaning everything around the character, needs to compensate for the character's proportions, whether that's oddly styled cars or misshapen houses. From the beginning of the vehicle's entry into Luca, we have two characters that need to be designed to fit the Piaggio Vespa. From now on we can call it Vespa, but for the curious, Piaggio is where the P on the logo comes from. But once they get to the coastal city of Porto Rosso, they quickly meet a third character, an older youth, possibly approaching his 20s. Add him in, and we have three characters who need to fit the same mold. Even though he is older, Ercole needs to have the same visual structure so that, when Luca and Alberto find themselves on the back of a Vespa, it's not a jarring change for the viewer. And so, large head, spindly body. Ercole is able to pass himself off as a competition contender's age because of this, separating him from the more subdued head-to-body ratios like many of the adults above or below water. But why make the vehicle so realistic as opposed to making it cartoonish like many other animated vehicles? Set on the Italian Riviera in the late 1950s, the animators took this not only as an opportunity to share, in some ways, their deeply personal stories of childhood friendship, but to also create a world that they would feel comfortable in. The homes were meticulously crafted, the texture of the roads deeply researched, but to make it as true to the nature of their story as possible, they also dropped in some very realistic automobiles. The Fiat 500, a classic with Pixar. No, 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 no. you will have your chance, Guido, you will have your chance and the Piaggio Ape, or a Vespa truck. This vehicle will seem familiar to you if you think back to Aquaman set piece in the coastal town of Sicily, though not filmed there, where Arthur and Mara ride in the back of a similarly styled Suzuki Carry. But why go so realistic for Luca when many other studios bend the rules? Pixar typically does go the realistic route, Cars is a prime example of this. But there's also the scooters and cars in Ratatouille, the Toyota Helix as the Pizza Planet truck throughout the Pixar universe. They don't strictly follow the model, but it's a rare occurrence the few times they are truly divergent. There's an interesting article about how Pixar actually hired very specific artists for the Cars franchise. Artists who knew cars and would be very focused not just on the stylization of the model but on the surface finish as well. For example, when in Cars 3, McQueen and Cruz find the old dirt track, many of the legacy racers have bumps and weathering that need to come across on screen. The surface modeling and rendering technology gets transferred over to Luca when you have Ercole's shiny Vespa and the final blue yet rusty Vespa at the end. In trying to replicate such a storied location of coastal Italy, even if it's not an exact replica of a real Italian town, recreating the textured variety of the Riviera means you bring in the same team of artists. The team subsequently needs to create either cartoon vehicles or utilize the cartoonish proportions that already exist from some of Italy's best design house history in Fiat and Piaggio. The added bonus of there being minimal vehicle traffic in the town anyway allows the animators to be very selective and use the Italian models that most fit the aesthetic of the story. Piaggio and Fiat manufactured timeless vehicles with just the right proportions for the story. 
and of course, being Italian automakers just adds to that authenticity. In an interview with Digital Trends, Luca director Enrique Casarosa said, There is something so beautiful about an old Vespa. In this film, it's even truer. The Vespa is the motivation behind Alberto's escape from solitude, and while the titular character comes to see the scooter as equally transformative, the Piaggio Vespa is really Alberto's dream. Luca's dream is more so the freedom of the surface, and the Vespa becomes the sales vehicle of the journey to freedom. It's not the Vespa that gets Luca excited, it's the text on the poster. Translated to English, Vespa is freedom. Sinking deeper into the detail and what Luca is really drawn by is that concept, Vespa is freedom above the water. I mean look at it, the Vespa is driving not on land, but on the ocean. I mean it's just a poster, but there are so many metaphorical layers on a piece of two-dimensional artwork in a three-dimensionally animated story. Look at any film about a sea creature, humanoid or not, and the crux of tension is about how the surface is too dangerous. Not the land. While that's an underlying element, what many of the kids want, the pre-adolescent Luca, or the 16-year-old Ariel, what they want is to be on the surface. Having the Vespa literally riding on the surface is next-level symbolism. I'm not going to break down the model in here like I normally do. That level of identification just isn't there when the animators are being purposefully ambiguous with the year. But theoretically, if we had a better shot at the Vin play on Hercules Vespa, we could pin it down. But the importance isn't in the specificity of the year. It's in the number of seats, and the open air against the writer's face. It's one boyhood's material dream, and another's desire for freedom. It's a beautiful story that does more than sell a Vespa. It sells youthful freedom. Pixar is uniquely specific in the boy's dream vehicle. There are layers to the decision. There are metaphors, there's symbolism, but not only that, in the story in general, there's heart, there's friendship, there are three kinds of family. One whole, one broken, and one lonely. There's a Fiat, there's an Ape, and yes, there's a Vespa. But to say that this movie is a hidden allegory undersells the importance of platonic friendship. To say this movie is just a 90-minute Vespa commercial undersells what it means to a duo of boys who have only seen boats their entire lives. Is this the right vehicle for Alberto? Is this the right vehicle for Luca? In the end, they realize it's not. But this story isn't about the ending, it's about the journey of finding your true self and what you truly wish for in this world that we've only partially explored. Did the Vespa get them there? Absolutely. For both of them. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.